So in a TV pilot, um, we have done a lot of stuff and they all have an element of multi-screen. So because we have done so many different experiments, so second screen in museums, and we are still doing that, we decided to just show you one little thing and um, make, uh, make, make it feel that you at least have um, um, and the flavor of what one of the tool sets provided in the project can do for you. If you go to the website, you will find many tool sets, some of them technically, so software, some of them uh, about IPR, but there are these different tool sets. And I'm just showing you one little slice of it, which has to do with how can we work with multiple screens. So, first, uh, a warning. This might actually be the last slide, because the last two times that I showed it, uh, tried to show it, because it's not done, it crashed. Um, Yesterday we did it work quite kind of okay, but um, bear with me because we are going to use all your phones and you're going to be part of the whole thing and we're going to do it in 10 minutes. So what I want to show you is how you could use certain tools uh, or certain interactive elements with the phones that people already have them with them in the classroom. So the first thing I want you to do is go to this URL. You can do that in your phone, hopefully. If you do it on your um, computer, just make your screen a little bit smaller so that it almost looks like a phone. So type in this URL and you should be see the slide that we are, um, are on. Uh, the nice thing, uh, this is all HTML5, and you notice you don't have to install an app. So we are trying to keep it low level. And like it says here, in a few months, we will um, make this available so that you can make your own uh, things. So I gave you a little bit of time to join in. So let's see who is there. So you should now get a, an, an question on your phone that you can answer. And we can see people answering the questions already. So what we are now see, are seeing is a normal PowerPoint presentation that you quite easily you can add these interactive elements. So I've now added three. So this is the first one. But you can also add games or if you're in a museum setup, you can use it in different ways. So there's always somebody who says, no, I can't vote, so who's lying? So yesterday it was Fred, so I'm wondering who it is now. But you... <laughs> it was you? Okay. So, but you can see that you can ask questions. And why would you want to do this that, um, in the classroom, in the different contexts that we're using? You can imagine, you're not, of course, you could do polling just to find out the answer. But in a museum setup, asking a question might also be about making people think about something. On which side would you be in this conflict, right? It's, it's, it's sort of a way to make people ponder or start a discussion. If there's a few of, or less 60% say, well, we need to build a wall around Mexico, you might have a way to discuss with people what the hell you are thinking, right? So this is the first small example. Um, the second one we are going to do is um, a word cloud. So again, it's a tool where you can, uh, you should be able to add words and you can use it for brainstorm. Like, give me what you're thinking in the first 10 seconds or the first minute. And of course, one of the problems is that people will be trolling and saying hi and first, but you can even see that there is some use in this context. Again, I'll let you go for a few seconds. But hopefully it will also give you some, of course, uh, things that you actually can talk about and you can use as a discussion point again. And again, this is just a, a PowerPoint or a Google presentation that it automatically uh, adapts and it's really easy to add these interactive slides. You basically overwrite one of your own slides with this interactive element. And you can see, well, let's, before it goes crazy. <laughs> I'm impressed with this one, by the way. <laughs> Not sure who did it, but... <laughs> So again, uh, both on my computer and on the phones, we didn't install anything. And uh, interesting question, who, especially for the Belgians, who is not on the Wi-Fi but on the normal internet? Everybody's on the Wi-Fi? But in principle, if you're using 3G or 4G, it will also work. If you're in a big setting, then you can't guarantee that people are on the same internet. It does not really matter. So you can also do it in multiple locations at the same time and because it's just using HTML5 and all the internet standards. So the last one is the most interesting one and where yesterday it started to kind of become slow, but it's also the most fun one, in a way, of these simple things. So what you can also do is um, upload uh, any picture and um, uh, ask people, you should now on your phone see a dot and you can move the dot into a location. So you can imagine, so this is like the obvious one, where are you an innovator or not, right? But you can upload your own picture and you can say, 
for example, you could upload your own drawing where you say, are you, um, somebody come with an example, are you innovative or not, right? And you can sort of, and this one, for example, is very good for peer pressure, right? You can imagine if all the kids, if all the kids are over here, and um, only one of them is over there, you want to ask him, why are you over there, right? And what, what's up? And what you, you can also do, and again, this is a better version. I'm quite impressed it's still working. But you can imagine that once the dots are there, that you can ask, okay, show me what all the women are thinking, or show me what, right? And um, if everybody sort of uh, is done playing, we will go to the next one. So you can see how you can use this. For one thing, this is analog, right? So compared to the, the voting, you can imagine that this is more on a sliding scale, right? It's more like I'm a little bit innovative, <coughs> not a little bit. Or you can really quickly just make up any drawing. So let's say you still want to make a vote, you just do on your paper, because we are going to add some drawing tools. You just do yes, no, maybe, and then you can use it already, right? So you can see how you can use it in the classroom, but also things like in workshops, which is true uh, for all of the tools. If you think about um, the, this morning, the question was asked, why would you make everything digital? And especially in hackathons, we do use a lot of uh, paper prototyping, eh? uh, grouping on, on post-it notes, and I please don't stop doing that. But for example, for the post-it notes, a lot of people don't join in because they don't trust their own handwriting anymore, right? Or you can group them, but at some point you lose all the post-it notes. Uh, the same with if you're in, a, in a, let's say, uh, uh, internally with 10 people, you, you can't really be anonymous. So if you want to use a word cloud, but you still want to be anonymous to have a discussion on certain things, there is a place for, I think, digital versions on some of the tools. Also paper prototyping, although I love it, if you have multiple locations, it becomes a problem, right? So there are, I think there are areas where you can um, use these types of tools to at least at, and enhance or extend what the analog version can do. So this was kind of my small presentation just to give you a hint on of one of the areas where you're using one of the toolkits in the TV pilot um, um, as a starting point, in this case, multi-screen. So we are now, uh, we have done more, also more for second screen, and we are probably, I'm not sure if I can say this, but we are probably going to now try to do a little bit more together with Museum Pilot, because we also joined quite a few hackathons, and we are now trying to figure out how we can join some of these different pilots together and um, add some of these elements in there. Not sure I'm on, how I'm on time. Am I okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, as Barbara said, I um, re coordinate the museum's pilot. Uh, the pilot is... Uh, can I? Sorry, just a second, I have problems in... Okay. The pilot is composed by uh, six partners. We have uh, we coordinate it, uh, and then we have uh, two small medium enterprises uh, providing uh, technologies, and then uh, three content providers. When we conceived the pilot, uh, we focused on what could have been the main challenges, especially for small and medium-sized memorials and museum. The, the major one is uh, mm, our resources, lack of uh, economical resources and the lack of human resources. That generates problems in accessing uh, technologies, adding new contents. If you think to very small museums, maybe they, they cannot enrich their uh, collection or their exhibition that easily. And they need to, uh, to be competitive in any case, therefore, uh, they need uh, to find new ways to entertain the public, to educate, to uh, engage the audience, to make their visitors to be returning visitors. So how we tried to, we experimented uh, um, a solution for these problems. We, uh, we thought that we could have uh, used uh, the contents from museums, combining them with, with the Europeana contents, using mobile and the web applications. I'm going to present you now the web application, the toolbox, and then uh, Sarah will present you the, the mobile one. The toolbox, uh, as I said, is a web application. It's based on open source uh, technologies. So it aggregates already existing solutions, and uh, it targets specifically staff uh, of museums and memorials in charge of educational activities 
It targets also uh, creative people, consultants in charge of organizing educational activities, but also that create uh, uh, video material or communication material for, for specific museums. Uh, the benefit of using this uh, um, um, application is that uh, uh, for um, museums can use directly mm, their staff because it's very easy and very intuitive to be used and uh, it was designed together with strict collaboration with uh, content providers that gave a lot of suggestions in terms of usability and uh, so there is no need of being trained or to, to hire other staff. There is a cost reduction, there is no need to buy new hardware or to install software, so it's completely web-based, so you just need a computer and a, a connection. And also for creatives, uh, the creation process is very, is very easy and they can share the same contents and the same databases with, uh, with their clients, in this case with the, with the museums. We tested uh, and developed the application in collaboration with the German Resistance Memorial Museum, um, in particular within two exhibitions. So it was uh, a real use case uh, that was applied. Uh, and uh, here you can see some pictures of the, of the events and of the materials that was uh, produced thanks to this application. Now I will also start with a very short video to give you an impression of the app and how it works. Uh, it was produced by one of our partners, um, so the, the app works via image rec recognition. You go into the museum, you take a photo of an object, and then you get information about the object. Um, so here you can see the process, taking a photo, then the object is recognized, and then you get a selection of possible hits and then you get information about the object. Mm. So at the Museum of European Cultures uh, we chose Um, okay, that's ah. We chose um, selected objects from the permanent exhibition um, to tell new stories, which you usually can't um, get when you are in the museum. Um, furthermore, we chose um, to add links to other platforms to give you further context where you can get um, new information about um, the objects displayed in the, the exhibitions. For example, you have links to Europeana or to Wikipedia if you're interested to yeah, find out more about the objects. Um, we designed thematic tours free, uh, covering three different topics. Uh, the first one is called personal viewpoints and this one is uh, based on a category the museum has on Facebook, which is called a favorite object of the month. And here um, the museum staff each month presents his or her favorite object. Um, for example, here we have the director of the museum talking about a souvenir scarf, which covers uh, European stereotypes types would end, but uh, makes fun of it. So you get a very personal um, perspective in the museum and you also kind of get a glimpse behind the, the work of the museum. So you get to know more about the museum staff. Then the second category was called upcycling and other unique objects. So for example, here we have a costume designed by a German designer who uses materials in a, a he recycles materials and uses them, them in an uncommon way. And for example, we added the question, which materials, themes and styles do you recognize to make the, the visitor become more aware and um, yeah, just have a closer look at the object and see what he, can, he or she can discover. Um, and then the third topic, which was kind of uh, where the focus was on, um, was called gender queer. And this 
is based on a research project the museum had in cooperation with museology students from the University of Würzburg and uh, the aim was to reevaluate re the object under the scope of gender norms and the queer topic. For example, here you have a champion, champion shot, shot costume and you get informed about the repressions homosexuals or also Muslim people have in these associations. Um, it's also a good uh, example for uh, the links we created to other platforms and further information. For example, you have a Wikipedia link um, where you can learn more about what what does uh, what is a champion shot king or queen and what is this, uh, uh, yeah champion shoot, uh, shooting association and then you also have a link to an article which goes furthermore into detail about this topic. Um, yeah, within the project we couldn't tackle all ideas we had but we kind of created further ideas which things could be possible for uh, future developments. Um, for example, you could have interactive um, aspects, for example, having social media functions where you can share uh, your favorite objects with your friends. You could have more audio and video material within the app. Um, you could try to link objects am among each other. Um, also having multilingual, uh, the possibility to um, yeah show texts in various uh, languages. So right now uh, we only have English and the mother tongue, but it would be great to have lots lots of different languages um, which you could cover. Um, and then a final idea. Uh, we had was to do workshops with adolescents um, with the aim to create their own personalized app tour through the museum. So they would um, get into the museum, do research about the objects, choose their objects they are interested in and then create their very own tour which they, they can share with their friends and family. Yeah, so that's basically it. <coughs> Hello everyone, uh, what you see there is the storytelling website that was developed for the photography pilot. Uh, this website has three main features. One is the items, which are the digital objects that you can uh, save uh, in this website and later I'll, I'll explain how. Uh, the second one is the collections that you can create with this object. And the third one, of course, being a storytelling website is the stories that users can uh, create on this website using uh, text that they write and the objects that they have saved. Um, so uh, in order to explain you the educational potential of this website I'm just gonna pretend that I'm a, a history teacher <laughs> and I want to create something for my student, a story based uh, mixed with uh, text and images. So the first thing that I would do is to log in, and this is basically the, the, the back end where you see your account. And then uh, the first step in order to create a story would be to search, the, to search Europeana Space, uh, which uses the WIT API. In this case, you, only see, you see there there are Europeana, Digital New Zealand, and the repositories. This is still a testing version of the website, there will be more repositories from which you can search. Uh, so you just type in what you want to search for and then you'll get a lot of different hits from these repositories. In my case, being myself from Milan, I decided to write something about the Cathedral Square in Milan. So I searched for Milan and Cathedral Square, I use different kind of keywords and uh, this is an example of what you can find. What you can do, you can check the um, checkbox next to the images so you that you can um, add them to uh, basically save them to the back end to your personal account on the website. Uh, if you click on any of these items, you'll go to the repository where you can find it. So in this case, for example, it was an item from Europeana. Uh, this is on the back end. This is where you see all of, all, all of the items that you've 
saved uh, from the search and you can al you also see that you can add items um, so you can also for example add personal images of the square or whatever you're <laughs> you're writing about uh, that way then what you can do you can uh, with the items that you collected or added you can create a collection and that's how it looks like and finally uh, here is where you uh, write the story so you have to go on the back end click on add story and then here you have to choose the title of the story the slug which is basically the name in the URL uh, that you will see you can give uh, you can credit the, the person and then you can write a small description of the story and then um, you can start adding pages and uh, every page is composed by uh, blocks and these are the four ones that you see at the bottom of the page so basically you can decide to have a file with text which means an item with text a gallery of different items a simple text or a geolocation map in case that the items that you're showing have a geolocation tag so for example, this is what the story that I created uh, as a hypothetical history teacher looks like. So I have created an introduction and this, uh, this day you see it's a file with text. So there is a, a, an item and the text that I wrote. This is again file with text. So you see that it, it can be files, multiple with text and under it is again the same file with text. Uh, then this is, um, still file with text and under every item uh, you can uh, also add a caption and if you click on it it, it goes on the specific page of the image uh, this for example the first bit is just the text then you have the gallery and then again file with text and yeah that was <laughs> the last slide um, so in this case basically uh, i for example i wanted to show to my students something more in depth about the square and i can ask to the students to log into the website and complement with their own parts of the stories or their own I item uh, my story but i can also ask uh, for example to help me with the search uh, of the images of the square so it can be used in, in different ways in a in a school environment and uh, yeah, of course, it can be used also not only by teachers, but for example, by glam professionals. But uh, I decided to impersonate a history teacher. So, <laughs> okay, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, within the photography pilot, we had uh, different uh, scenarios. Uh, the one Cla uh, Clarissa presented was one of them. Another one was focused around augmented reality, but the main aim of this scenario was to provide tools for others to build uh, augmented reality applications or other applications which interact with uh, images. Uh, so, in general, images are an incredible useful tool uh, for education to learn from. And what we actually want to do is to engage people to interact with these images. Um, how can we do that? So we could develop some applications and then we just have one or two applications, but actually we want to make it easier for others to create applications and as such have even more uh, opportunities to interact with images. Um, to do so, one of the things is to build up an international standard. And one of the standards we are using, we have also been involved in creating the standard, is GP Search, which is the standard of the JPEG Standardization Committee. I'll not go too far into details of it, but basically the idea is that uh, you can combine components developed by different uh, partners. And because the interfaces between these different components are standardized, it's easier to make them work together. So uh, one of the uh, aspects we provided is an API to dynamic, dynamically request uh, different variations of static images. So typically an image is a static resource, but the API allows to uh, retrieve variations of the image. That means different resolutions, uh, different qualities, uh, just a thumbnail, a specific region of the image uh, without you having to go into Photoshop or to do anything uh, of uh, editing. Um, 
so that allows to build applications that, for example, typically include an overview of thumbnails uh, much uh, easier. And it can dynamically be optimized based on upon the available uh, bandwidth. Uh, so one of the examples what you can do with this is you have a picture, you just retrieve, retrieve specific uh, tiles from it, you shuffle them and you can make a, make a puzzle. So that's just one example of something you can um, easily do. Another thing uh, we provided is similarity-based uh, search. And there, the aim was that you can match a new image when you're walking uh, in a city, Leuven in this case, uh, and match it with uh, an old one. Uh, and to make it more clear, I'll just give a short demonstration. So try to mirror my uh, iPhone screen. Yes, there it is. So let's now just assume that we're walking through Leuven on a cloudy day and having to hit McDonald's. Uh, so the application we have is just a demonstration of the algorithm. It's not a finished application, but it's something that we provided uh, to other peoples in the hackathon to work with and new things with. So we're in Leuven now, so I can select to use the camera. So I the camera now. So that is the uh, McDonald's. So with a picture, I can uh, submit it, and what I get is a picture of exactly the same location uh, as it used to be in the 60s, 50s. Flat, is it flat here? No. So, uh, but, uh, it's just a demonstration and the Ah, uh, flat is there, so what time are we talking about? Sorry, I forgot to use the mic. Okay, much, much earlier. Anyway, <laughs> so we've been traveling back in time. But the idea is, of course, um, so what you can do as well is to provide a rating how well my new picture matched the old one. So the idea is basically that you provide the old images to uh, students, for example, and you let them search for uh, that particular, particular location and let them make... Uh, new picture that tries to match the old one as good as uh, possible. And in such a way you can interact with them and make them a little bit more active, <laughs> physically active. <laughs> so that's it for the photography pilot. Uh, thank you. OK, we're good. Um, well, for our pilot, we didn't really kind of focus on kind of developing a tool. I think for us, when we uh, bring it into this kind of context of learning, we were thinking about what is it that we think about learning. So in other words, for us, teaching is something that happens to you, but learning is very much something that you kind of bring to, to yourself. So for the book itself, the, 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 uh, the, the pilot, was the idea of building on top of the work that we'd done around open educational resources, developing up a range of open classes, as well as exploring kind of the, the work of my colleague Joanna Zielinska, looking at um, kind of uh, a range of projects called Living Books About Life. I'm not going to talk in detail about the book because today I, I saw this very much about what does this mean in terms of education. So if you want to know what the book is in the book, we've got eight chapters, then you need to go to the website. Uh, and we've all been given kind of five minutes to talk. Um, what I will say though is for us when we think of photography and we think of photo mediations that I think Joanne von Kuberta kind of really best sums it up, that this is about exclamations of vitality. So in other words, if we think of photography students, we need to think of what does this mean today when we begin to kind of create images. So it's not that we, I guess, kind of disrespect the past, but we really need to look at the opportunities that today presents. So how we've been kind of working through this is... Uh, through the development of the book and what that meant was then also kind of creating a range of kind of evaluation workshops. So working with higher education students primarily as well as professional kind of practitioners. In order to uh, sort of explain, because this isn't a tool that you go and you use in terms of going to a website to download and then upload your images or to recreate text, this was really trying to create a new kind of methodology and kind of pedagogy for how we might approach this particular means. So consequently, the guide was very much a kind of a, a 10 step process to engage with the idea of open and hybrid publishing. So this isn't, I guess, the, the radical extreme of open access publishing. This is looking at that, that idea of how we conversion and create a range of different publishing options. 
For us, a hackathon was very much also this idea of a festival. So in other words, how do we really begin to take a book apart? You know, a lot of the ideas that we have in terms of the book, take it back to that idea that this is not something which is fixed. This isn't something that we simply place on a shelf and see as this kind of finite object. A book, very, by the very nature of it, has always had multiple layers to it. So that is really key to when we think about digital and when we think about analog technologies as to how that we are working. But equally, for us, you know, what we're trying to do here, I guess, is kind of model this, this new approach. So the photo mediations book, uh, I think Camilla's now moved somewhere. Uh, aha, you're taking my seat. Um, you know, again, to sort of express how we can kind of reinterpret the same information, um, where we, uh, I guess in this particular instance, we're focusing heavily on the idea of open and hybrid publishing for images, was to then recreate this and reimagine this as an actual reader for students to go away and use as a resource. I think Joan, uh, Camilla does have a copy of that with her as well, that she was going to be my glamorous assistant and, and, and hold it up. <laughs> I let you hold it while I do. do. <laughs> so you can download it for free. You can kind of buy the, buy the print book. Um, and it, uh, can you remember? 18, 18 pounds, isn't it? Yeah, it's 18 pounds. There we go. You see, you need opportunity to kind of sell it. Um, I look, I'm just, look, we've got five minutes. So. I think, I think the key thing for us is, uh, during the evaluation phases, and this was built into the project, is it's very easy to read about these things. It's very easy to read about what Creative Commons is. It's very easy, in a sense, as soon as you know where to go, to use the tools to be able to apply it to the work that you want to produce. But, you know, I, I think for, as, a, as a lecturer and a, a photographer, it still can exist as this thing that's over there. So I have my work, I have my practice, and I still kind of put a copyright on it, or I don't necessarily think about it. So our way of trying to essentially create a call for action was to introduce this creative call for me photo mediation. So we launched that, and within the kind of the, the first tweet, we seemed to be kind of making a point, and people seemed to got it with nearly 4,000 kind of impressions. Um, but I also had the opportunity, and I'm saying this because I don't, won't get a chance to do this, I was in Australia, so we also were able to launch this kind of project and this creative call, kind of not only in Europe, but also kind of uh, in the Asia Pacific. And this is a great little uh, kind of uh, Twitter video, uh, Facebook video that we kind of created. So when we're thinking about photo mediations, yes, we are talking about glitch, we are talking about remix, we are talking about digital, but equally we're talking about this analog sense of how we begin to work. So this is, for us, these are never either or, this is always an either and kind of situation. Um, so the, the, the work that was happening in my lab, which is the Disruptive Media Learning Lab, was again working with kind of a, a range of media production students and photography students to really sort of have this intense experience as to what this means. So we launched this online for anybody to take part, but we also engaged in a series of kind of creative jam sessions. And it was great, because I think what we in initially kind of envisaged with this was that people would just do this. But if you're asking somebody to use a particular resource and you're asking them to engage in what the content of the book was responding to, somehow or other you needed to get an exchange of ideas. And being 11 hours different from my colleagues back in Coventry or in the UK was a real reminder of the opportunities that the digital provided. So consequently, rather than running this as a, a, as a, a closed but open call, so in other words, submissions via email, we immediately started using kind of Instagram, Twitter, and we're finding that participants across the, the continents were kind of engaging with each other and beginning to respond. Equally, other people who, so we created a whole set of rules for people to be jam leaders as well as to be jam participants. And I mean jam not as in what you eat, I mean jam as in this, this idea, you call it a workshop, you call it, uh, you know, it, it's, as soon as you create, I think terminology was critical here. So in this kind of context, for this, this, this particular jam leader, they wanted to leave out photo mediations, they wanted to leave out all of these things. This was about, did you want, do you like to win stuff? Do you want to be a mashup master? Or do you want to be a remix ninja? For the people that they were engaging with, that was the words and the terms that were appropriate for them. So again, this idea of kind of relinquishing control was really important. But equally, and gradually you found that more and more people started kind of uh, really beginning to explore this, sharing their work and kind of really engaging. Um, and, but I think as, as 
jam leaders ourselves. So there was, a, there was a gentleman I worked with, or two guys I worked with in, in Australia. I don't think any of us read the instructions that we had written for, to be a jam leader. So I wrote them and I never even looked at them or used them when I was delivering it because in those scenarios you're trying to respond and react to the, the needs of the people in front of you. So that I had one particular girl who basically wanted to prove everything that we were doing was wrong. So in other words, oh, you're, you're saying we don't have to use Photoshop, you're saying we don't have to do this. So we created a randomised tool, so both for the software to engage with this, worked with open kind of source, uh, primarily HTML kind of um, means of kind of remixing or glitching work. She says, what about video then? So then we had to go on a search to find kind of video alternatives. What about audio? So this whole idea of kind of being able to respond and react meant that we really came up with a set of challenges, which we're now going to develop into a, uh, a series of challenge cards that, again, anybody, these will be obviously CC licensed, people can add to them and contribute to them and kind of develop their, this further. So hopefully this will enable it to become truly this, this node in a network of educational resources where people can tailor and adapt and keep kind of working with them. So there were some great things where it was literally kind of screen grabs. So I always work on the basis, if I'm telling you all of this, where's the, the, the proof of the pudding? You know, there's a, I'm just going to end on a, a few little quotes that the way that we normally understand images as something frozen, the Melbourne Jam was great as it opened our minds to all of us. So this idea is photographers, when they're, they're really focusing on how they can make this as something uh, real for them, and what they mean by real is they can go and make a living from this, really gave them a, a, a new insight into how they, this could happen. And I really like this one from, from Mike, one of the, the guys who ran one of the sessions. It tests out a different set of skills and creative approaches in ways that they don't realise, which is really smart. It's tacit learning. And finally, I think this was the, the crux of it, because I introduced myself and asked who, how many people want to be a professional photographer. Every hand went up. Then I said, how, when was the last time somebody bought an image online? Of course, there was the one cocky person sat on the floor in the corner who put their hand up and said, yes, I did. This, this disconnect, I think, is a really important thing for people who are going into anything to do with the creative industries to look at these as kind of opportunities. So this idea of looking at licensing within their future work, not in terms of licensing my future work, but with my future work, as I think is a really poignant kind of moment. So thank you very much for listening. Hi, hello. Um, so yes, I have the pleasure of working with colleagues at um, the new University of Lisbon to create one of our tools and with um, colleagues in IN2 to create the other. And you've got the banner up here. And I'm just going to uh, show you a short film of each of these tools. Um, the first one, Dance Spaces. Um, I think both of the... Oh, I've got to try and find out. Uh, so Dance Spaces um, uh, was designed really with the general user in mind um, rather than a specialist user. The idea being that one could collect images uh, and uh, audiovisual still images, content from Europeana and tell stories through uh, making a dance narrative. And at first we were thinking that this was primarily for a general user, but as I'm going to talk about soon, once we started taking these tools into an educational context, we realised that they had much greater breadth and potential impact than we thought. Um, so this is really about a storytelling tool, how dance gives people who are using this tool access to think about their own experience through the lens of dance. So dance is the prim primary content with, with, within the dance spaces tool. Uh, it's very much like a digital scrapbook um, uh, and so that you can organize this content how you want and what was important for us is that in creating um, examples of this we were able to find some of the, in a way some of the hidden dance content in Europeana and bring this out and show some of the users we were working with the kind of content that they hadn't found before and more importantly in a way to show that juxtaposing this different kind of image would, would give them access to different ways of understanding and making sense of this content. Um, so this is what it looks like once it's um, pulled together. Um, and again, you can see these tools through the site. And then our next um, tool, Dance Pro, was designed much more with the professional dance uh, expert in mind. Try and find the 
Sorry, I can't see it on my small screen. Um, and Dance Pro is a unique and rather wonderful and innovative annotation tool uh, designed uh, by my colleagues at University of Lisbon. And what you have here is just an example of, of how once you're playing the movie, which you can either do in real time or you can use a, a, a pre-existing movie, you can annotate over the, um, uh, the film as it's playing. There are many different icons and tools and different ways in which you can annotate. And then as you see rolling across the bottom, it records the annotations and you can play back and link back to the places in the film, what you were interested in looking at, and you can then start to map against the film that you're seeing um, the different ways in which you're choosing to, to notice, observe and record particular moments of the, of the movie. So those are the two two um, tools that we've been working on and developing. And what we discovered through our user testing and through our hackathon, um, that once we took it into a, a context where there were teachers and learners involved, then there was much more potential in the tools than we first realised. We had a digital dance day back in March. Uh, we hosted it at my own university, Coventry University in the UK, and it brought together a wide range of educators and learners, um, primarily at tertiary and higher education, so at university level, post-grad, um, and uh, the, the, we learnt a lot through that, and we learnt a lot about the potential that we hadn't necessarily thought about at first, which was, uh, first of all, that these tools, and particularly the uh, Dance Spaces tool, was a really valuable um, tool for distance learning. So we had some uh, educators who were building distance learning packages, and this became a really valuable um, resource for them to think about how they could use it. Um, it also um, offered to us a way of thinking about a different kind of uh, critical engagement with, with the content. And for example, the annotation tool, the Dance Pro, which we thought of as being primarily for the more specialized expert user, um, we realised that actually what, what it was doing was creating a kind of meta-language, a sort of shared discourse or short, shared vocabulary that was reflecting on this very particular content, dance content. And so, for example, some people thought, well, this is going to be a great opportunity maybe for those with visual impairment to have a different kind of access with dance. So it started to, started to show to us the different ways in which these resources could have a different, um, a different impact. Um, we, what we started with was a number of playlists, um, again, which we'd gathered from Europeana and using our own platform, our own eSpace platform, uh, to show, as, as I mentioned earlier, some of the sort of content that users primarily didn't even know was there. So we were bringing to the surface and offering up to the community this broad and really varied and rich range of content um, that many of those people who were with us on the date didn't even know was there. So it served many purposes. Um, and what it became for us also was this um, a, 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 a possibility, a resource for a different way of publishing through these tools, publishing knowledge about this content and importantly individual stories told through it, so a different kind of publishing tool. And I think, and all of that is going to take us um, uh, all of that has been building up material which we're going to develop within the MOOC, which we're going to be hearing about next. So we've been building a resource of information for that. Thank you. And this is, this is our, our new world, isn't it? Um, games is the future of learning. Um, it's, it's clear, isn't it? Children grow up in that kind of environment. They expect to live and learn in that world. And we've, we've got Europeana with a vast range of resources available. It's obvious, it's easy, it's the future. Is it? Is it the future? Because um, we know, I mean, we've discussed earlier today, not all teachers are necessarily confident with technologies. Do they really understand the potential of what they have to work with? Um, and of course, the reality is that in schools or in museums or other environments, the technology isn't necessarily there. They might have a grant, you know, to get 50 new iPads, put those next to the 10 PCs, they're a bit old, they're getting a bit slow. Um, the, the environment isn't necessarily there to just implement games and take over the world. And of course, as the very first slide that Barbara showed this morning, what about the traditional methods? 
um, they still have some merit, surely. So what did we do with in Europeana space? This is the games pilot. We were never intending to create you know, multi-million euro games to challenge the, the gaming market. Um, our task was to create demonstrators, to, it dem to inspire people to reuse content in an educational context. We've created a casual game which is about restoring paintings that are from Europeana. Um, a creative game that makes people create videos and montages with easy drag and drop technology and as Barbara said an educational game um, which we can use selfies and play with portraits. So this is the, this is the restoration game. It's based on 1980s um, arcade game called Quix where people um, draw down and restore the picture. Um, the quicker you do it, the, the higher the score you get. Um, then you move on to the next picture. If you don't get the high enough score, that's it, you're done. So there's, there's a game aspect, but also you're restoring a picture that's there from Europeana. Our second game, as I say, is, is um, about building videos. It's about simple drag and drop. You don't need any experience, any expertise. It's a way of creating your own soundtrack, stories and montages. And our third game, um, this is a fun one. Um, it's using actual portraits um, from, from Europeana and you can either take a selfie of yourself in a dramatic pose trying to recreate the picture or you can use it on a, a, game, a game basis with friends. Um, so we've got an iPad um, and we're about to... So, so Sarah, Sarah's got an iPad here and what you have is a picture from um, Europeana. Um, yes, yeah, of course. Um, and I am going to, and I am going to create that pose, am I? Yeah. So the idea is that Tim is going to try to be the portrait. It's, 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 it's not pretty, I promise you. Um, so, yeah. So uh, yeah, I put the microphone down because there isn't one in the picture. These are the filters that you can put onto onto the picture, um, and then once once Sarah's decided that she's matched the picture, she will apply that, and we will get a score to see how well we've done. Um, so that's the picture. Um, Ten percent. <laughs> there we are. Yes, you must must try harder. <laughs> I, th I, th I think is is the um, result of that game. <laughs> but yeah, you, so you can see that it's a fun game that you play, um, and it introduces the artwork to people, and you can click the I button to get some information on the picture. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a, it's a fun game to play. Um, oh, now now Sarah's just going to take pictures of everybody and filter them. Um, so yeah, as I say, this this is really. This is to inspire people to reuse cultural heritage material um, in an interesting way. And we're showing how it can be used as a fun kind of educational task. I mean, of course, the, the reality is that... Um, th no, don't worry, Frederick. There, there, are, um, there are educational things that come onto the market every day of the week. Um, so it's, it's about pitching it and getting it right. 
Um, go, going back to games as a way of learning, um, I think the University of Ghent study showed that traditional methods still score more highly, but there's more enjoyment from people learning through games. So it's all about getting that, that balance. So, so the conclusion really, of course, is don't replace teachers with games, um, but do use games to really creatively inspire and think about different ways of doing things and get that balance. And East-based games are a fun way of doing that. And here's, here's an, the next one. Um, so, so I'll put this down. Um, no doubt the time will run out, but um, I shall. So I'm restoring this picture. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not a good picture to start with, but hopefully... So the picture's taking shape. So Tim, we just made up a new name for you. We are going to now call you Gay Master. <laughs> I've had worse names. So there you are. So, so you, you can see the, the, the picture. The picture's clean, um, so you get the artwork, um, and the, the top score is how much I needed to score to get to the next picture, and it could go on until you don't score enough to move on. So there you are. That's the games. Thank you.